transformative t landscape task force meeting. Um, for those of you who are just new to this group, uh, we've been meeting for a few months. We've we've undertaken the job of uh, making sure that Clayton's commemorative uh, objects reflect the values of our community, and uh, we will we are looking at not only adapting current uh, landmarks, street names, or what have you, but also adding uh, landmarks where they where where things have been overlooked, um, you know, and and things that are really important to our community and the development of our region that just haven't ever been recognized. And so we aim to do that, and that's why we're totally excited to have the Osage. Uh, representatives here to talk to us. We, we are thrilled that you would take the time to talk to us, little Clayton, about all of this rich heritage. Um, so I think, Andrea, if I'm, if I'm right, can we just, just move on into this, this discussion? I think Sarah may have a presentation for us and you know I'll let you guys take it from there and then I'm sure we'll have some questions later. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, well, thank you again, um, Mayor, for inviting us. And um, as you mentioned, I'm a representative of the Osage Nation. I work for the Osage Nation Historic Preservation Office. Um, and I'll be giving us just a very short <laughs> and concise Osage history presentation. Um, just so we're all kind of working uh, with some basic knowledge of the Osage occupation in Missouri and in the Clayton area. You share my screen and I'll get that presentation running here. And Sarah, once you give it, will you be able to send us that presentation so we can have it for our reference? I, I may be able to do so, yes. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, so when going through Osage history, the best place to start is at the beginning with the Osage creation story. And the Osage or Wajaje um, began as spirit beings in the sky uh, amongst the stars and uh, decided that they wanted to inhabit the earth and came down through different uh, levels of heaven uh, to try and occupy the earth. However, when they got close, uh, they found that the earth was uh, completely inundated with water and they had to uh, uh, land on red oak trees and call on a lot of uh, spirits and, and different uh, creatures for help. And eventually the great elk came to help, was able to uh, help banish the waters. And once that was done, the land was revealed and the Osage were able to take the form of people and uh, start their wanderings across the earth. Now this creation story um, has a few different uh, variations uh, between certain clans, um, but the, the general, I think, and most important part of it um, are the three groups in which the Osage descended down through the heavens to inhabit the earth. Um, and we see these three groups of tribal organization throughout Osage history from the very beginning at the creation story, um, through today and some of the tribal organizations. So the three groups were the Wajaje, the water people, uh, the Siju, the sky people, and the Hunka, the land people. And the Wajaje, the water people, led the other two groups in the wandering. And the further back in history we go, we are looking at multiple lines of evidence. So not only looking at oral traditions, but also looking at linguistic information, uh, looking at the archeological record, looking at geography, um, other oral traditions from other tribes, but really the linguistics, the Osage oral traditions and the archeology span are, are what I'll be really speaking on today. And the Osage are a member of the Dagian Sioux speaking people, the Dagiha. And uh, linguistically, what this means as the Osage, as well as the Quapa, Ka, Ponca, and Omaha, were at one time one larger group of people speaking the same language moving together. 
And as we try and track this larger group throughout time, we can use linguistic analysis to kind of figure out timing wise uh, when there were shifts in this language, when they were different splits. And we can look at that in conjunction with the archaeological record, shifts in material culture, as well as the oral traditions between all of these tribes that explain some of the changes in culture over time to find geographically where the Osage were on the landscape. And one of the earliest places that we can track the Osage is in what archaeologists call the Middle Woodland period in the Ohio River Valley. Um, which is uh, an incredibly complex period of time. There's quite a lot of long distance trade, a lot of different collaboration and cultures uh, meeting and talking to each other. But during this time, according to the oral traditions and the uh, linguistics, uh, the ancestral Osage, uh, that one group of Degean speaking people at this time period, began migrating west down the Ohio River Valley. And this migration happened for several centuries. Um, the Osage oral traditions uh, speak about specific stops along the way, um, but eventually this migration west hit the confluence of the Ohio River and the Mississippi River. And at the confluence, there was the first split in those Degean speaking people. Uh, the Quapaw decided to head south down the Mississippi River into what's now Arkansas while the rest of the Degean speaking people, the ancestral Osages, headed north up into Missouri and Illinois. And um, this was a time period of really establishing ancestral Osage territory in Illinois, in uh, Missouri. And this was uh, known as the late woodland period between about AD 500 and 900. So several generations of occupation throughout this area. At a certain point, at about AD 900, something changes. There's this huge population shift away from these areas in Illinois and Missouri into one area, into one specific spot. And that would be um, what is now known as Cahokia across from downtown St. Louis, the St. Louis area, generally speaking. Um, so a few of you might be familiar with Cahokia. It's right across from St. Louis. Um, if you've had a chance to visit, it's still at Illinois State Park today. But Cahokia, um, which is also known as Neoconska Sea in Osage, was emanating uh, what we call Mississippian culture throughout the Mississippi River Valley. And that, um, Something's very compelling about Mississippian culture because it kind of spreads throughout the southeast of the United States as well, back east up the Ohio River Valley as well. Um, we know that ancestral Osages were a part of the development of Cahokia, the city itself, and part of that Mississippian fluorescence that happened at that city. And you have trade from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, as far east as the Atlantic Ocean. Um, trade uh, items from as far west as the Yellowstone, perhaps Mexico. So this was a massive cultural undertaking. Um, unfortunately, at about 1350, 1400, uh, the city collapses and the Osage um, again moved west to reorganize themselves and reestablish their territory and their people. And they kind of moved right into their backyard in Missouri. And this time period that we like to call the late prehistoric period before contact um, is often the time, pe time period that people are thinking of when they're thinking of kind of traditional Osage occupation in Missouri. Uh, Osage territory in Missouri was really the entire state, a lot of uh, Northern Arkansas as well with hunting territory established in the plains of uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, long distance trade networks up to Wisconsin, down into Louisiana. And uh, the Osage villages and the Osage established areas of control um, during this period of time are kind of throughout Missouri, um, but are most often known in um, uh, central and southwest Missouri. And because of this long occupation, centuries and centuries and centuries of occupation in Missouri, there are a lot of different kinds of sites, uh, Osage sites that we would find on the landscape. And as um, 
a task force on commemorative landscapes, I thought this would be something that uh, you all might be interested in. Um, across the landscape, you would find hunting camps, trails, sacred sites, rock art, um, and many different kinds of Osage burial sites. Uh, oftentimes, I think folks, um, just because we don't have a very strong Native American education component in our public and private schools, um, People have a much more stereotypical concept of uh, Native American sites, but really every aspect of life and death, you would have seen those kinds of sites throughout Missouri. Um, one of type of these sites um, are Osage trails. These extend throughout uh, Missouri. Um, these are just some of the larger main trail networks that uh, we have mapped. There are much smaller trails and trail kind of segments throughout Missouri. Um, but we uh, try and keep track of these trails because if that's where people are moving consistently, then that means those are higher probability areas that we might find Osage sites associated in the area. Um, and some of these sites are considered sacred sites. And sacred sites are those sites of such extreme importance that they actually are protected under federal law. So any Native American sacred sites, uh, especially if they are on federal or tribal lands, have this special designation and therefore have enhanced protections under the law. For Osage sacred sites, these are extreme important, uh, extremely important sites that often include rock art sites, burial sites, um, and these um, in particular in Missouri and Arkansas often are throughout the Ozarks um, and can occur on hilltops, uh, caves, rock shelters, and other places of, of that nature. Um, for St. Louis and in association uh, Clayton, another type of sacred site are mounds and mound spaces. Um, so most people know about Cahokia, perhaps they might know about Sugarloaf Mound, which is the last uh, standing mound in um, downtown St. Louis, which the Osage Nation did purchase. Um, but there are countless other mounds throughout what we consider St. Louis County, West County, um, that were unfortunately demolished early on. Even though the mounds themselves are gone, the mound spaces are still considered sacred spaces to the Osage. So often um, any sort of commemoration or interpretation um, of these sites where these mounds stood, we would want to discuss you know, those sites and their, their nature as sacred sites. Um, if anyone's been downtown St. Louis, there is a memorial now where great the Big Mound of St. Louis, one of the largest of the St. Louis Mound Group once stood. Um, because that space, even though the mound is gone, is sacred, the memorial uh, still stands. Another uh, aspect, which I won't get into, and I'll, and I'll defer to Dr. Diaz Granados and, and Mr. Duncan on this, but um, are rock art sites. Those are also of extreme importance uh, to the Osage Nation. Picture Cave in Missouri being one of the uh, most well-known, most important rock art sites, um, which, which depicts um, ancestral Osage and Mississippian iconography. There is um, a wonderful book <laughs> uh, about Picture Cave that I, I highly, highly recommend anyone who is interested in the topic take a look at. Um, it is uh, an incredibly impressive um, amount of work. But to jump back into the history, um, all of these sites are throughout the landscape of Osage ancestral territory. But in Missouri, Osage uh, don't, um, I wouldn't say meet, but contact with Europeans doesn't happen until 1673 when Marquette and Joliet locate the Osage south of the Missouri River. Now they did not actually go to an Osage village or meet an Osage person. Uh, instead, one of the other native guides pointed out where the Osage were and they put that on their map. And since that was the first recorded European knowledge of the Osage, that is what stands as contact in uh, 1673. Um, in terms of the early Europeans coming into the area in Missouri, the French were the most important to the Osage. Those French explorers, fur trappers, and traders 
um, they settled amongst the Osage and established a really strong relationship um, with the Osage and um, the Shoto families and others really used that close connection to establish a near monopoly on the fur trade in Missouri because they had such a close connection with the Osage. Um, early Jesuit priests in the Catholic order were also a very important part of that relationship. Now the Osage clans at this time are part of um, the, the larger Osage organization that I mentioned at the beginning as part of the um, tribal organization. We don't have a ton of time to get into it. It's, it's incredibly complex. Um, but I think it is important to note that uh, the Osage are born into the clan of their father, and all of these clans are very highly structured and belong into kind of one of those three larger groups that I mentioned that we can track back to the earliest creation stories. And that clan structure for me as an archaeologist is really important because the villages of this time period are actually laid out according to this tribal organization. So uh, Osage people that belonged to the clans of the Sky people uh, were always north of the side of the village. Uh, the clans of the Earth people uh, were south of south side of the village, and there was always an east-west axis to the village space. And in the archaeological record uh, for a village of this time period, if you're excavating and you already know the general blueprint, um, it helps you quite a lot with interpretation and understanding Osage villages from this time period. And Osage villages were semi-permanent. They were almost always near major waterways. And uh, the Osage did not live in teepees. <laughs> That's always our number one question from tourists out here. Um, but the Osage lived in long lodges, often constructed from bent hickory poles. And they could be anywhere from 15 to 30 feet wide. They're very large structures. Large extended families would live in these lodges. And the doorways on these lodges would always face east to meet that rising sun. And as I mentioned, they're laid out according to this, uh, cult, all the cultural divisions, that tribal organization. And that blueprint could expand and contract depending on the number of people in an Osage village, um, but there could be um, between 20 and 200 lodges in a village, just depending on the lodge size and the village size. So to give people a little bit of a better understanding of what these would have looked like, these are some historic images where you can kind of see that framework of bent poles that would have uh, been used in the construction for, of some of these lodges. Um, people ask us a lot about how uh, Osage traditionally lived in terms of subsistence. Uh, what were people eating? Uh, how were they surviving? Missouri and the Ozarks especially are a perfect location for hunting, gathering, and early horticulture. There are plenty of rivers, lakes, springs, so you have a lot of animals and a lot of biodiversity to take advantage of. It's kind of the perfect place to live. Um, that hunting was an incredibly important part of Osage life. There were multiple hunting seasons. Uh, a winter season in February, a summer hunt in May, and then a fall hunt um, in September that could last for months, depending on, on how well it was going. And agriculture was kind of the second half of this uh, equation. Um, there were cultivated plants, um, corns, beans, squash, pumpkins. Uh, fields were planted by Osage women in the spring, harvested in the early fall. Um, so there was a, a, another kind of more um, uh, really intense horticulture, kind of this taking advantage of domesticated um, foodstuffs um, was a part of that subsistence. Unfortunately, this traditional um, life way kind of uh, came up against the history of America, uh, especially after the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s. Um, the idea behind the Louisiana Purchase was not only to you know, gain more land for the United States as a political entity, uh, there was also an idea that all of the tribes that were living in the eastern side of the Mississippi River uh, would be moved across the Mississippi and kind of forced west and open up all of that land to uh, the Americans and, and white settlers and farmers. 
unfortunately, there's kind of an obvious problem with that, <laughs> that people already were living west of the river. And um, all of these displaced tribes that were being forcibly removed were being moved into places where there's long established uh, territories, already established treaties and political uh, entities. So oftentimes people are unwelcome and it's going to be, cause a, a lot of conflict. This time period, um, of you know displacing people trying to gain more land pushing native people out of america really um became also a time of land sessions when the when the united states government was coming to each tribe and trying to set up treaties to take control of their territory so as you can see from this map um, the osage had several major treaties with the united states uh, seeding land, one of the largest ones being the Treaty of 1808, when almost all of the state of Missouri and really the northern half of Arkansas were ceded uh, to the U.S. government. And when we look at the actual acreage from all of these land sessions, from treaties between you know 1808 through the 1820s up through 1872, the Osage only received a penny for every six acres that were ceded. Now the Osage did have a Kansas reservation. Um, if anyone's familiar with um, Little House on the Prairie, that's about the time period we're talking about. Um, however, um, as is depicted in that book, more and more people were coming into Kansas, uh, kind of squatting on land that they weren't supposed to be on, including the Osage Reservation. And by 1865, the Osage decided enough was enough that really there wasn't going to be some sort of a remedy for all of these people forcing their way onto their lands. And they agreed to the sale of their Kansas land in order to purchase a home in Indian Territory or what is now Oklahoma. So the Oklahoma Reservation um, was established um, after official removal in 1872. Uh, if you'll remember that land session map, the Osage actually ceded that land first to the United States. The United States forced the Cherokee onto that land. And then the Osage had to buy that land back from the Cherokee. Um, and that, uh, that type of land session and land ownership, and it's an, inc uh, the, that story you see over and over, it's an incredibly um, uh, complex time period and really its own field of study. Um, but the Osage, unlike many other tribes during that time, were able to purchase their land um, because they had sold their reservation in Kansas. And today the uh, Oklahoma reservation is now Osage County. Um, and the Osage, uh, even though allotment came and the Osage were forced to um, give up some of the, the surface rights, the Osage Nation continued to control the mineral rights. So you're all, if you're in Osage County, Oklahoma, you're always on the Osage Reservation if sometimes you're not in the reservation, if that makes a little sense. Um, today, the Osage Nation uh, operates in uh, kind of a three branch government system, much like the United States with an executive, legislative and judicial branch. Um, the headquarters is in Pahuska, Oklahoma, where I am right now. And uh, our office, my office, the Osage Nation Historic Preservation Office is a part of the executive branch. Um, we're also known as the Wajaji Kotsi Kitsea. Um, and our main mission is kind of um, externally facing. We're responsible for consultation, investigation, any sort of planning that has to do with any of the federal, state, or local laws uh, when it comes to cultural or sometimes it's considered environmental resources. So the National Historic Preservation Act, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, the Looting Law, ARPA, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, <laughs> as well as all of the state statutes in terms of unmarked burials and cultural resource protection. We're the office that has to you know, consult with all these external agencies. So oftentimes um, we're the point of contact for um, a task force like this, um, asking a little bit more about Osage history and, you know, today, how do we protect 
and correctly preserve Osage cultural resources across um, Osage ancestral territory. And unfortunately, that is uh, that is a, a lifetime commitment. There are so many um, so many Osage sites that are consistently in danger of destruction from looting, vandalism, increased development, and natural disasters, especially now with climate change, um, our, our plate is full. And we have to spend a significant amount of time and resources making sure that Osage sites are you know, first identified correctly, but then are being afforded all of the protections available under federal and state law. So when people ask uh, about Osage ancestral territory, this is the map we provide because it kind of encapsulates all of that history from kind of the furthest back early, early migrations in the Ohio River Valley, as well as some of the um, closer in history um, territory and Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Illinois. And that is a very, very brief <laughs> and concise um, overview of Osage history. Um, and certainly uh, I could speak on hours on any parts of, of that presentation, um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea about Osage history and why St. Louis and Missouri is so important uh, to the Osage nation and, and why we're um, so happy to get your call to uh, be consulted on a task force like this. Great, thank you. That was really, really interesting and informative. And like I said, I'm sure if we could, you know, we can get a copy of it sent to us, we'll probably put it on our website as a city as, as we move through letting our public know what we are what we are considering. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm interested, <clears throat> of course, with um, uh, Carol Diaz Granados and, and husband, if you have something to add to the presentation at this point, or one of the, one of the really, the things we wanna know is what, what can we do to commemorate their Osage uh, existence here what, what are some ideas that you may have of, are there certain locations, are there certain ways to commemorate it? Um, and this won't, this doesn't have to be the only time we talk to you about it. Obviously this can be an ongoing conversation. And if we did something, I know that you would want to have some oversight of it, you know, to, to make sure it was, it was right. Um, but can you, can you elaborate on any of that? And, and also anything else that you wanted to tell us? Well, I'd like to start <laughs> Uh, commending Sarah for an excellent presentation. She, I think she covered everything that should be covered. She did a beautiful job, uh, Sarah. And um, <clears throat> the other thing is that I thought she was going to say something about a site in Clayton, an Osage site in Clayton. Yes, I didn't know if you wanted me to, to jump in. I saw... Um... Uh, that you have a presentation next. So <laughs> I wasn't sure if you wanted me to wait or. Well, you actually covered everything. Jim was going to to give a history of the Osage people, but you pretty well covered everything. So um, the only thing that I was going to add to it is that if you were going to identify um, a site, an archeological site in Clayton, um, I thought it might be of some interest. I would um, talk about there are three archaeological sites in University City where I live and um, have been identified. So um, I think a point that both of us could make, Sarah, is that um, even though we live in extremely developed cities, urban areas, there are little pockets here and there uh, of that are untouched by urbanization and it's amazing that you can still find archaeological evidence um i i will just go ahead and say that um and i, I wrote it down so i don't wander like i'm doing now um, <laughs> in university city there have been at least three um, archaeological sites identified in the past two are along the river de Pere, as you would imagine, including one where a stone celt, and Sarah would know what I'm talking about with that, 
and a three-quarter grooved axe were recovered by a landowner, Howard Murphy, back in the mid-1980s. Um, we went to visit him back then. He was elderly then. Um, he had actually attended the 1904 World's Fair, so he's not with us anymore. But the three-quarter grooved axe is indicative of the late archaic in Missouri uh, and goes back around 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. So that's, uh, and that's, I'm sure we go back way, I know in Missouri we go back at least 10, 12,000 years, but in University City at least 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. One other site described by Mr. Murphy was a hill above Olive Street Road in the vicinity of Blackberry Lane, where back in the early 1900s, Mr. Murphy grazed Mr. Sutter's milk cows. Um, he told us that the hill was covered with arrowheads, and we're putting air quotes, arrowheads, which we refer to as projectile points. So there are archeological sites. Now there's um, houses all over um, Blackberry Lane. So I doubt if there's anything left, but you just never know. So I'm curious to, to learn, Sarah, what site <clears throat> you have identified in Clayton, Missouri. Yes. Um... Uh, what we had done, we had done a little research on some of the Osage trails that uh, go through Clayton. Um, one in particular actually crosses um, through what's now Oak Knoll Park, um, which I think if in terms of kind of the um, brainstorming ideas about, you know, areas where we could put up some sort of commemoration about Osage occupation in the area, that might kind of be perfect because as Carol just said, so many of these sites, you know, we might have a few indications early on, um, but a lot of them have been, you know, graded away for development and, and homes. Um, so we, you know, homes are there now. It, it would be a little more difficult to figure out exactly how to um, set up, you know, an interpretive panel, a wayside, a statue, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. um, we were thinking. Um, so it, uh, I was really um, happy to see that there's an established park and an open green space um, that might be good for, for consideration for some sort of commemoration. And that Osage Trail um, was used up to kind of the, the historic period as well. Um, so this also, it would have been used prehistorically, but it was also used um, as part of kind of that, uh, that uh, the fur trading. Um, where folks were bringing things into St. Louis and, um, you know, historic St. Charles and those sorts of areas. Interesting. So, I mean, do you have sort of a, a map of the actual trail, the actual path where it went in Oak Knoll? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, we do. Did you, bring, um, did, you, did you bring that to show us or... <laughs> no, I was I did not because I wasn't sure. So the, the only issue that we have with... Um, with sharing some of that information is unfortunately looting is such a problem that anytime we share very specific, like a latitude yep. and longitude, like anything anyone could Google earth, <laughs> okay. um, we find that sometimes people wanna go out there and start digging around and looking, right. if not for projectile points, other things. Yep. Um, so that is another conversation we would wanna have in depth with you. Um, how to interpret that without putting up a sign of where people, you know, might want to come dig around. Mm -hmm. um, no, I understand. Yeah. That's smart. So I, I can definitely tell you what part of the park, <laughs> but I wouldn't want to give you a map quite yet until we, we have that discussion about how information is handled. Okay, no problem. Um, well, I think that's a fantastic idea. I don't know what, if others want to comment. Do you, are there just out of curiosity, are, Sarah? Are there other places in Clayton that are that are plainly have been used by Osage or where trails have run? I'm just curious. Um, that's the main trail that hits through Clayton. Um, I there are other areas, but kind of right outside of Clayton. <laughs> oh. um, and then you know there wasn't in for. I mean, maybe Carol could speak a little bit more about this, but. For large sections of Clayton, you know, that development happened before archaeologists went in and surveyed. 
Yeah. So what we really have are kind of secondhand accounts from landowners letting us know where things used to be or where they used to go collect arrowheads. Um, but by the time archaeologists had a um, kind of a way to get in and do survey and things like that, um, most of the, a lot of these neighborhoods had already been um, really disturbing the landscape. And there was, um, you know, the St. Louis Academy of Sciences and a few folks that were early precursors to um, archaeologists, but often they were more um, avocational and um, just kind of interested <laughs> as kind of a hobby. So we don't have as precise of information as we do now. Mm -hmm. um, so there aren't any particular sites that I could point to on a map um, besides that trail. And also knowing that that trail ran, ran through that section of Clayton, you know, we, it's a, there's a higher probability then that there were Osage uh, affiliated sites along that trail in that landscape. Mm -hmm. um, but whether or not they're still existing is something that I, I wouldn't really be able to answer. Gotcha. No, that's, that's good. Comments, anyone? I was curious. Thank you so much for these presentations. They're very uh, informative and exciting to think about how Clayton can um, uh, acknowledge more of this heritage. Um, I have a question for maybe both of you, but um, I guess it's, it pertains to the concern about the um, treatment of the land by speculators and so on. Uh, would the Osage Nation itself want to conduct archaeological research in Oak Knoll Park as a part of a, or be, would that be, a, it sounds like that would be potentially valuable in addition to whatever historical marker um, could be developed here. Um, and is that something that you do? Is that part of your uh, collaboration with municipalities at, in different places, I'm wondering? Um, our office has, you know, we do employ uh, archaeologists and we have conducted survey. Um, for something like this, let's say, you know, if we were putting in something that would be ground disturbing, like a statue or something along those lines, you know, we might ask that archaeologists um, survey the area before to make sure that there's nothing, you know, um, that could be adversely impacted by any sort of ground destruction. Like if, let's say we put in like a a sidewalk over to like a little area that talks about Osage history, we'd want that area, make sure archeologists check it out. In terms of having um, a people from our own office, um, that's something I would have to ask my director. It's not something we do very often outside of Osage Nation projects. Um, but certainly there are archeologists in St. Louis um, and in Missouri that, you know, we would, you know, be happy to have survey some of the area before any sort of work would happen. Um, and let's say that their investigation did reveal that there was a partially intact site in Oak Knoll Park. And that's another conversation of, you know, is there an archaeologist in St. Louis who might want to set up a field school, it, depending on the type of site that might not be appropriate. <laughs> so there are a lot of questions that um, we have to answer kind of as we got more information in about the area. I'd like to throw in, have any of you, I know I'm sure Sarah has, any of you others been to Cuba, Missouri, where the people of Cuba, Missouri put up a beautiful monument to the Osage. It's a 30 foot tall iron statue, so to speak, of an Osage man, woman, child, and a dog. And you can see it from uh, 44 when you're driving actually to and from the reservation. Have any of you seen that? Look it up on the web. It, 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 look up Cuba, Missouri. It's a beautiful monument. And they also have uh, exhibits uh, in their uh, visitor center. They're, they're very, um, very dedicated to the Osage in Cuba, Missouri. Great. I've been through Cuba many times, but I just drive through and I've never, I didn't know that. So thank you, that, that'll that be great to investigate. Yeah, we had not been informed by um, Andrea. Well, we asked, she was, she uh, with all due respect said, you know, talk about the Osage. So, so we did not really think about uh, what would be an appropriate monument or something to the Osage or signage or whatever. Uh, my background's in advertising, so I know all oh. about signage and things. So. Oh, 
I spent some time in that business. So, <laughs> yeah, it is no more really. But um, well, and any other comments or questions from our task uh, force members? We have a uh, very active group at Washington University in the Department of uh, Anthropology. And we've been monitoring several areas around this confluence, St. Louis. And uh, there are several areas that are quite large, believe it or not, in the city. And uh, I know we work pretty closely with Dr. Hunter on these areas, but there's a, there's a sizable amount of archaeological evidence that dates back to the hiatus of Cahokia, uh, East St. Louis and Mound City. They were actually three large mound groups of which Cahokia is only one. Uh, the downtown St. Louis mound group, we are monitoring an area and we watch very closely for development. And when anything comes up, we usually blow a whistle and try to get and I'm glad to see Sarah. Now I know who to call. <laughs> but uh, we've done some checking, Sarah, and there is a an incredible large amount of material still extent, believe it or not. And uh, sadly, the mound group is gone, but there is a great deal of the village that surrounded that mound group left on the north side and that's as far as we're going to go with this talk because of the same problem that Sarah finds with looters and and uh, casual diggers and avocational people but uh, yes there is an active group monitoring and they're centered at Washington University in the winter time and they're over at Cahokia in the summer and I'm part of that group as is Carol Fantastic. Um, when did you have a question or a comment? You're muted, dear. You're still muted. Who's muted? Gwen. Gwen, she's trying to say something. Okay. I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, Carol, you mentioned those three sites in University City. Mm -hmm. uh, have they been commemorated? And if so, how, how were they commemorated? How? No, they have not been commemorated in any way, number one. Um, the I'm glad you asked that because uh, I, I did want to say that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did a survey along the River De Pere, and they had asked me where these sites were. So I took them to the areas where the sites uh, had been found. Beyond that, I don't know what they did with that information, but we're talking about eight or 10 years ago. And um, Gwen, it would probably, if, if, um, if Michelle or Katie would be interested to contact the US Army Corps of Engineers, because I'm sure there's an extensive uh, report on the sites along the River De Pere. And they might have found additional ones um, that they did not tell me about. <laughs> um, okay. The ones that I I mentioned are ones that I know about, and I told them about it. Thank you. Okay, Katie, any any questions or comments from you? Um, well, I just wanted to thank Sarah. That was an amazing presentation, and and also. Um, it just so happens we're planning a, a historic marker project in Clayton and Oak Knoll Park was um, one of the sites we were uh, planning on uh, putting a marker to uh, um, give info on the two uh, homes that are currently there, but this adds a whole new and exciting dimension to that site. So I'm so happy um, to hear about that. So so if I can ask Meredith, I don't know if you had questions. Um, okay. But this is where Meredith, you might want to listen real hard because I know you're my process expert. Okay. You and Andrea, what would be the process that we would go through? Let's just say, you know, as a city, um, what we do, I can, I can hear somebody's radio in the background. I don't know who it might be. That was me. Um, I unmuted, but I shouldn't. So I will. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
if it, what what we'll do as a city is to we're gonna we'll come up with a list of various things that we want to take action on, and we will um, get community input on those. Um, and I can't imagine that anybody would object to any of the things that any of the commemorating anything about the Osage. That's just not going to happen. So let's say we go through that process, um, but then what would be the process if we said, hey, great, Sarah, we love this idea. This is what we wanna do. We wanna commemorate this Osage Trail in Oak Knoll Park. And you can, of course, guide us to uh, the appropriate location and the appropriate way to maybe some options for commemoration, you and um, our, our folks from WashU, um, because they are all, and, and also Gwen, you guys all have experience in how to commemorate something well. Uh, what's the process for getting that actually done? And this would be at no cost to the Osage Nation, by the way, this would be the city of Clayton and or the, maybe the Clayton Century Foundation would, would um, you know, uh, support that. Michelle, I think you outlined part of that process quite well. I mean, I think there's a lot of conversation that would need to happen initially around what that commemoration would involve what the story would be told and what what form it would take is it a you know is it a text plaque is it a, a sculptural element is it you know what 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 form does it take and I think that might you know relate a little bit to the story that that we want to tell about the Osage and their history in this space and so it, it sounds like there would probably need to be a group to come together to really talk about that and and um you know i think the other thing to just to make it more complicated to think about is that there are other kinds of ways of um commemorating that history that might be temporary or performative or things like that as well. There was a wonderful project that was done in 2004 in the Kennedy Forest in Forest Park um, uh, with the Osage and the artist Karen McCoy, who's out of Kansas City. And it was a temporary project that, um, you know, that brought a lot of people together. And it was a, a can send you some information about the project, but it was called Tree and Tree and it involved um, uh, planting an Osage sapling in an oak tree that had uh, a, um, a, a dead oak tree and sort of talking about the, the history of using and manipulating trees to as sort of wayfinding and marking territories and pointing their direction to different places. And so there are ways to do things that are very sort of artistic and poetic um, that talk about this history that also aren't permanent pieces, but that can engage a lot of people in um, in a in a in a real sort of um, uh, meaningful way in um, in learning about the history of the Osage in this place. So I, th I think I think that all goes into this conversation, and then once there's sort of a, a little bit more consensus about the story that that gets told and the form that it takes, then you know, then we know if, if it's an artist, it's looking for an artist. If it's, you know, if it's writing something, then, you know, putting that writing together and things like that. Oh, you're on mute, it, Michelle. That, sound, that sounds great. Um, so I guess my, my, the other part of my question about the process is what kind of a process do we have to, you know, engage in with the Osage Nation in order to make this happen. I'm sure we need some kind of approvals or some other, I don't know what, we have to apply. I don't know, do we have to fill out a form? No, that's <laughs> just, you know, what is our process? There's, there's yeah. no application to talk to me, uh, thankfully. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so my director, Dr. Andrea Hunter, is the designated historic preservation officer for the Osage Nation. And um, internally, when it comes to some like cultural adjacent and making sure things are culturally appropriate, we directly um, consult with uh, the Traditional Cultural Advisors Committee, which is a committee of Osage elders. Um, and so usually they're the ones let's, that kind of give us the yes or no, if something is appropriate or not culturally speaking. Um, that is not a process there is a process uh, that has paperwork involved if you are like a high level researcher wanting to do a dissertation on the Osage. For something like this, 
Um, what we have done with other projects, um, uh, Tower Grove Park, in, for instance, um, is we, Dr. Hunter or myself, um, we work with you, uh, whatever, let's say you wanna have an internal subcommittee or action group, um, you know, we'd be happy to be on those phone calls if that's a, you know, every other month or monthly thing um, to, you know, provide our, our input on, you know, um, wanting something permanently to, you know, let people know about an Osage, you know, commemorative area, um, develop that. And usually whatever we come up with, like a first draft or general concepts, we bring to the elders um, at their meeting and they let us know if we're on the right track or not. Um, and they, we just kind of keep them updated. We meet with them monthly. Um, there is no, you know, documentation. As you mentioned, the Osage Nation is not paying for a statue. <laughs> um, however, what we can do is let you know that there are Osage artisans that work in sculpture that might be, that we might want to, you know, ask if they would be interested in collaborating with a project like this. Um, there's those sorts of things that we can talk about. Um, and that's, that's more of kind of a, I want, I want to, I don't want to say staff to staff, but it's just us consulting with you. Um, there's no official, um, uh, documentation or approval outside of, you know, the elders letting us know that this is appropriate or not appropriate, whatever it is that we decide on. Great. That's good news. Okay. Um, well, I think this has been wonderful. Um, I don't know if any, anyone has anything else to add to this discussion, but if, and I'll, I'll give time for that, but if not, I think what we want to do is add this to our list is it okay as we put our list up on our website to say we have an Oak Knoll Park location that we're considering as, as an Osage? Okay, so we can at least say that it'll be public. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, can, we can start getting community feedback on that as well as other things that we're considering. So um, I think that is where we are for now and, and um, within, I'm hoping within a month or so, we can come back to you and maybe start thinking about moving forward. Um, two months, I don't know. It takes us a while to get, get our act together. We're a city. Jeff? I just wanted to ask for the name of the anthropology, uh, archeology span professor at WashU again. Sir, you mentioned there's someone, Dr. Hearn or Hurd? Oh, Dr. Hunter is, is my director. And no, so she, okay. It was not you, it was the, um, the gentleman with, with Dr. Diaz Granados mentioned someone at Washington University here in St. Louis where I also work and I was um, referring to that person, not Dr. Unless that's also Dr. Hunter. No. Uh, Washington University right now is um, Grant Stouffer. Stouffer. Who, who is the one working with, with uh, Osage and Cahokia. Thank you. Did you not have a university affiliation you mentioned at the beginning? Me? Are you are you affiliated with the university yes, as well? Yes, I teach at Washington University. That's, that's, I've been teaching there for 39 years as Katie <laughs> remembers me from way back when. Um, <laughs> teach American Indian art symbol and meaning, or used to call it American Indian art and iconography, but when I changed the name to American Indian art symbol and meaning, we got more students because nobody understood what iconography meant. So, um, and uh, for the last several years, I've been teaching uh, a course called Body Art, Body Modification Across Cultures, which also includes Osage uh, tattoos and things, but mm -hmm. it's, um, most of our research that Jim and I have been doing over the last 30 plus years is, is with American Indian rock art. And that's how we got involved with the Osage. And um, I was adopted in 2008 into the Osage tribe, into the uh, Gentle Sky Clan, Sisu Washtaki, and given an Osage name. So I'm very, very honored. And that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, quite an honor. Um, well, I. I... I'm a bad note taker, so I didn't write down your university affiliation at the beginning. But I, you know, again, thank you. And obviously, you, we again, we've got so many good resources here to help us along this this road. Um, so, 
if that's what we, we have a few other topics for our task force. And if that's all we have for Osage. Mayor, I was just going to ask one question. Well, not really a question. Um, Sarah, I'll probably reach out to you um, later on. I know you said that there could be a, there, you could tell us a certain area of the park. And I know that there might be some work done like along the, with the county, with the roads on the outside. So I just want to make sure that that's not something we need to be aware of, you know, ahead of time. So I'll just touch base with you on that separately. Good. Okay, so good. So again, we thank you so much. Um, we will be back in touch with you. And I'm wondering, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to go and do other stuff that you need to do for your day. But if you want to stay and listen to the rest of our conversations, um, you are more than welcome to. We'll, we'll sign off here. But um, like I said, my I, I'm very well, uh, well aware of, of commemorations for such things and uh, with my advertising background. So I'd be happy to be on a you know, task force to, to end association with the Osage. Happy to help in any way that both of us and in any way that we can. And thank you for including us. Wonderful. Thank you for joining. Hi, thank Sarah. You so thank much. you so much. <laughs> yeah, That's thank great. You, thank you so much. Bye, all. Bye, Katie. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. Um, all right. So that was awesome, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, Very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So next on our agenda, and we, we're going to try to end by 1.30. Um, next on our agenda would be to talk about some old business, um, which is the discussion, first of all, of the attic school marker language. And I know that you all received that. And this is a project, obviously, that the Clayton Community Foundation has undertaken and kind of had have been doing it before we even started our task force. And I think it's great that we can collaborate together to just make this um, marker the best it can be. Do you guys, did you, I'm sure you looked at it. Is, is it something that we can screen share, Andrea? Yeah, I was just gonna ask, um, which, do you want me to pull up the text or do you want me to pull up the sign itself? And I can, I can show um, either one, I can just only share so one. So the, the text, I guess, first, and then the, um, the visual, the concept also. All right. So um, just first, I, I should mention we are, um, in the final stages of Alex um, is in the final stages, I should say, of gathering all of the um, appropriate information necessary for us to get approval um, from public works and um, that sort of thing and get together a, uh, some um, materials to reach out to potential donors for this entire project. Um, we are starting with attic school in hopes that by the beginning of next month, Black History Month, we can um, uh, reach out to the community and let them know of our plans to um, revise the attic school marker. Um, so in terms of, um, I know that, that a couple months ago I sent out um, some text that has since been revised um, because our group, I, in, in that previous uh, document I sent out, I included information on the um, first school in Clayton, the first Clayton schoolhouse, which our history group has since decided to do a separate marker for that. So this text, actually, there is um, nothing really that changes from the text that's on the marker right now, except for saying that it is the second school to serve African-American children in Clayton. Aside from that, the text is exactly the same as what um, is on the current marker. So um, I guess from this group, I just want to um, have discussion if we need to um, and hopefully get approval from the group so that we can move forward um, with um, implementing this. 
So does anybody have any any comments about this language? I know we've, we've looked at it before a little bit because um, I think this is kind of the final stage here. If you think that there's something missing or misstated, now's the time to speak I have up. A question. I don't know the answer to this, but I know that um, the there's been conversation about the use of African-American versus black. And I know that the AP just changed their style guide to reflect um, black. So I wasn't sure, I, I don't know, you know, I'm not um, familiar enough to know which, wh whether, you know, whether or not one is the correct terminology or not, but so I just figured I would ask the question. Good question. That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. Um, when well, do you think I don't on that or either? Well, we, we use both. Mm -hmm. This is a issue that comes up a lot in, um, you know, scholarly work on race. And uh, I think the convention is similar to what Gwen describes in that people tend to use these terms interchangeably and have, um, and I think African-American and black are are considered, you know, equally legitimate. There's some some ten con contention around whether black should be capitalized or not, always, for example, and those kinds of things. But um, as I see this signage, as that issue goes, I don't see a problem in the in the use of this description. And I think it's really important, actually, in this context, related to. Um, something I was going to raise, which is the reference to the American Revolution. So it is, I think, especially appropriate in this context to identify Crispus uh, addicts and other um, Black Americans as Americans mm -hmm. uh, in this in this usage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wondered though if Crispus addicts is um, identity as an African-American warrants mention. Um, and I just was looking this up. I mean, I had a general question about how he might best be portrayed. And I, in terms of, you know, you hear, you see him described as the first um, martyr. I mean, there's, there's some, there are more, I think, dramatic approaches than are, of course, necessarily warranted. But um, I, I, you know, I know we've looked at this before and I apologize because I feel like I should have probably said this earlier, but I wonder if there, if there is um, possibility of a more honorific reference to addicts as not only a casualty, the first casualty, but, um, you know, the first American killed. Um, in the American Revolution, or something to that, some, to that, uh, uh, something of okay. that nature. Can I also raise one other issue, and then I'll just stop talking for a long time. Um, and, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other is, you know, as I read the really rich um, background information from Donna Rogers Beard, it occurred to me that the sign might ideally honor one of the key people, particularly these um, black women, I assume, who, who actually made the school. So the, the city of Clayton provided for a school to exist, but the school was made by the people who, who led it. And if there was a way to acknowledge, say the first um, superintendent or the last superintendent, and I know there's not a lot of room here, but I just wanted to put that on the table because it, it, it would build more depth in, into the commemoration and, and more acknowledgement of um, of the you know the the, edu the contributions to education in Clayton at this site. That that's actually a really good point. Um, I can go back through that uh, information and um, I'm also working with. Uh, um, I know I'm, I'm not an expert on these markers, but I know that there is a, um, a key number of words before you hit that 
um, and lose interest. So I have to play around with that as well. Um, oh, so this is the this is the um, the visual. What what we're thinking um, the sign will will look like. This is from one of the vendors. Um, and it does give some dimensions there. Gwen, do you have any things to add to this? I, I really don't. Um, I, I, I guess casualty sounds a little passive to me. Um, that's that. You know, that's. I, I don't think it shows much agency on his part. I mean, does that accurately reflect that he was just somebody that was killed? Or was there something more involved in that? Um, I, I don't I mean, know. that's not a big point because the point is about the school, the school itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is the, I think that's true. It's, it's easy to get lost in some of these other things. And, um, you know, the, the namesake is, is an important feature, but. Um, it is, and I, I, don't know, I don't know what it wasn't, you know, in, in, in St. Louis, it was very important to African-Americans that the schools be named, the schools that served African-American children be named for African-Americans. And it was, a, you know, it was a big push for that. Mm -hmm. African Americans were responsible for that, mm -hmm. so the name is important, and why people why it was chosen is important. I know all that can't go on a, on a marker. But, <laughs> I I do like, but I just this is just the point that I was trying to make. Yeah, um, I can play around with that um, that word casualty and and maybe try and get something else in there. I, I do like Jeff's recommendation of perhaps um, mentioning one of the, um, and I don't have um, Donna's information in front of me, but um, one of the women she mentions um, in her list of information, I think that would have a lot of meaning. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I can, I can work on, on that. You know, and I'm just noodling this because I just did a little Googling on Mr. Addicts. Um, you, I mean, you could play around with it, but you know, he, you could kind of go in the direction he was the first American killed in the American Revolution. I mean, that would hit at at least one of Jeff's points um, and also Gwen's point that these schools were named after Black Americans. Um, and that was important. I don't know. It's almost, it's hard because you, you can't put everything on here. It's almost like you need another interpretive plaque to go with the plaque. Well, that was, yeah. a, it was the, the, the question I was going to ask actually, because I've been thinking about this in relationship to some of the public art signage that we do and that, um, you can't put everything that you want to put on, on these signs. And so, you know, is there, a place on the internet where people can, if they're interested, learn more. Um, you know, if, I think it's, you know, it, especially if there's going to be more, more mm -hmm. signage like this put up so that those stories can be told. I mean, they could, because that is that those was sort of, when I was reading through this, you know, right, I want to know more. Well, how, how many students and, you know, were there any people who, you know, what, what did they go on and do in the community? And, you know, there, there's, there's so many other stories that sort of, that could, right, and who is addicts and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so, and I don't know if there's room on here to point people to a website either or, or something like that, but it would be great if there is somewhere on the internet that accompanies uh, the signage where people can learn more. I think that is a great idea. I was thinking that too. In other words, if there was a little, you know, those squares you can scan yeah, or whatever, or <laughs> yeah. and you go there for more info there, you just scan that and you get, you know, I mean, maybe it can't be ready for this plaque, but it could be developed. I, I don't know. I, I just feel like that's a great idea. And when we do any of our landmark uh, 
work. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I think we should absolutely try to strive for that as an accompaniment to the landmark because we'll never be able to put all the information that really is deserving out there, I don't think. And I would suggest that if you're going to put a website or a QR code that it be separate from the plaque, just attached to the um, hole itself because, the, you know, you want this to last for a very long time and it's, you know, technology changes quickly. Exactly. Great point. And yeah. that would allow yeah. you, Katie, to develop it, you know, subsequently. Yeah. So you could go ahead with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, in terms of the visual look of the sign, um, this is, uh, we are thinking about it as a, it's a, going to be a black background with um, gold lettering. Um, our CCF logo is going to go up top there. Um, it's a, a seven foot long uh, pole that the sign will sit on top. We can cut the pole to any height. I don't know what the ideal height for something like this is. Um, but in, in terms of just the aesthetic, are, are, are we okay with that or yeah, I mean, I guess it's this, I mean, I, in doing this, will this be potentially um, a design that would be used for other signage? And, and I guess was that sort of in part of the consideration in the design yeah. is that this would be replicated? Yeah, yeah. And in terms of height, there's probably some best practices out there in terms of, um, you know, putting it at reading height uh, for people that that we could find or, I mean, you're, your signage contractor might even have some advice on that, but um, mm -hmm. I think I think the design is very clean. Um, it, it's very classic. I mean, it sort of feels like very Clayton, <laughs> like if it's. Um, um, but it, 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 I think it also is sort of in the vocabulary of of these kinds of historic markers that you see in other parts of the country. That this is sort of. I mean, if I were to see that from, you know, from a distance and. I, I think I would know what that is. <laughs> you know, the, oh, yeah. that must be some sort of historic marker and I would uh, yeah. know that that's something to approach and, and read and what I would, you know, create that sort of expectation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Okay. Uh, is, there, is there anything on the back? Is there a space on the back? It, it, it's, it's going to be, um, the last conversation I had with Alex, um, it was going to be this, it, it's a two-sided. Double-sided. Yeah. The same, oh, narrative. the same narrative. On both the sides. same, yep, yep. Is there an image of the school? What the school looked like? Do we have any documentation of that? We we have an image, but the image we have is 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 not very good quality. Um, uh, that's something actually that I never even considered. Um, might be good to consider it. However, we are again working with limited space here, and perhaps that's something that can be added to the. Um, to the web okay. yeah yeah i mean it was the, you, i mean you could put the an image on the other side oh oh that's a good idea okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna recommend that um you know if you guys are okay with this you we've given katie some input mm -hmm. and i think all really good quality input and i know that she's um very invested as is the Clayton Community Foundation and getting this done the right way. But I'm gonna suggest that we send her off with this input and not make her come back to us again. I think we're gonna leave it up to their good judgment as to what now goes on there. Um, so. I agree. That, okay that would be that? great. Okay. And I will, I will go back and do another um, look at Donna's info and if I can put any mention of some of the key uh, teachers or administration um, that played a meaningful role, um, I can put that in, um, see, see how it looks. Yeah. If, if not, if, for, if, if my history group just thinks it's too wordy, are we okay with just this? Yeah, I am. But I do think okay. you ought to give special consideration to saying he was the first American. Okay. So okay. I, okay. I think that would, I, to me, that's kind of an important thing that's easy to change if your group is okay with it. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. You can even say American Patriot. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I like that too. <laughs> hey, you guys, we have to stop now. We have to stop giving. <laughs> American Patriot is good. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. I, was just, I was really joking about Patriot. It's oh, a, you were? What? I guess it's, it's, it's a puffed it. up word in our yeah. political culture. It's getting thrown right. around a lot. Oh, lately. you yeah. know what? Right. Scratch. But it is good to say American because, you know, especially in these times when yeah. you know, even Black citizenship is being you know, challenged now. Let's, let's yeah. emphasize that he was an American. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Great, thank you, everybody. Um, moving on, um, we have about 15 minutes left that we can use to cover an update on the draft evaluation criteria. And um, I, I um, don't know if we'll have a chance to look at our current list, but I think that's okay if we don't have time for that. So um, I think Meredith and Jeff were the ones that were tackling this primarily. So do you wanna share with us your update. Jeff, do you wanna start? Sure. Uh, so we, we met and um, proposed a, I, I would call it a, um, a kind of curtailed list of principles that we, we draw upon, uh, within which we draw upon the uh, ideas that Meredith presented at our previous meeting and um, do you want me to pull them up or should people? Yeah, let's, I mean, if you can. I can, yeah, I can if I can share this. Um, I think this is a, I have a bunch of screens open. Um, so you can see that, yeah? Yes. So what we've done, what we've recommended is a, um, this is just a description of the level one and level two idea, but we recommend on our landing page for the task force, a statement of principles that guide our work that is currently the, the draft proposes these three. And then a, another level of detail for people who want it about um, where we elaborate criteria and We'll eventually have language about process, but but that's detail that is I think you know we need to develop in part by doing a trial run with or some beta testing of some of the you know things on our list already, like how do we arrive at decisions and so on. Uh, but the what we, the advantage of this approach we think is that we have something out there immediately stating our guiding principles, you know, inviting community response and everything. And then we um, we can build this kind of staged, uh, we can build this elaboration on top of that. I think beginning with this second, so this would be a, you would link from the task force page currently to a new page that would be, you know, something like mayor's, you know, guiding principles, review criteria and process or something like that. And each of these uh, from level one are restated and beneath there are them some elaboration of, beneath are some elaborations of what we mean there or key considerations relative to that principle. Mm -hmm. um, but really this, where this ends is a question for the group, you know, where the document ends, what's where we are now in terms of what we present ends and what comes next is something that we should discuss. Now, Meredith, if, if, if you have something to add there. No, I, th I think, you know, I, th I think again that this allows for um, some statements of principles to, to be um, to be published and posted and for people, you know, stakeholders and other constituents to to react to them as well before we um, before we move forward with implementing any kind of criteria. And I did like the idea of sort of beta testing the criteria in a way to sort of, um, you know, pick a couple of, of, you know, of things on the list as a sort of case studies almost that we can walk through. And um, so I think we're really just looking for your thoughts on this approach and then the language itself. And I, Jeff, can you, 
make that any bigger. <laughs> I can't see it on my screen. Um, if you can. Which, which part do you oh, want to look at? Oh, the, just the front page, maybe language. I don't know if you can just make it like 100% or something like that. Um, it's, yeah, it's like 200. Oh, it is. It shows eighty four. It shows eighty four. Yeah. I think that's on your. Oh, I have mm -hmm. to change my share screen setting. Right? Is that right? Well, it's, a, it's okay. I. I, 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 mean, I we have got it. I've got it in the minutes too. Yeah, we've got it in print. Um. Yeah, I'll I mean, share my screen because I have the current list pulled up too, so I can kind of toggle back and forth if you oh, like. Oh, great. Okay, great, that. Andrea. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm going to say it. I'm going to have a hard time finding it. Okay. Hold on. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, could you guys, while she's doing that, elaborate on what you mean by doing a base test with a couple examples on our, our website? Well, I think we have some draft criteria, and I think um, maybe having um, this working group come together and, and use that criteria and really talk through um, our approach and to, to really see how that a, cr a criteria would be applied, I think is what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. Jeff, do you want to elaborate on that? You mean, you mean among ourselves? Among or, ourselves, or, yeah. Okay. So if you took the portrait of Ralph Clayton, for example, what would, how would we arrive at the, at a decision about that or a recommendation about that? Mm -hmm. um, applying these criteria, I assume there would be something like a proposal that would say um, the task force should consider whether this portrait should be removed or relocated, relocated or recontextualized and the task force would then come up with a recommendation and response. But you know, the criteria, the criteria suggest there will be some process for their application. And I don't, we didn't feel like we had as a, as a committee really um, that we were there yet as a task force in terms of, you know, we just haven't figured that out quite yet. Okay, and, and, and I guess what you're saying is that going through like a case study, like for example, that one, and maybe another mm -hmm. that's sort of different from that one um, mm -hmm. would, would kind of help us understand if this is the criteria, the ones that we, you've sent out, right. what we want to use. Right. Um, and just refine them and tweak them. So not that we have to wait to do anything before we do all this refining, but that we can, as we go, <coughs> refine how we will describe the process and maybe tweak the process. Like um, mm -hmm. one of our guests today described an action group. You know, they'd be interested in joining an action group. Maybe our process involves forming an action group that must do some something around uh, a proposed effort like commemoration of the Osage heritage of Clayton. Um, so I, I think we, the thought is we can just, we'll, we'll learn as we go. We have some ideas now, we think they're good ideas. We just need to figure out how to describe the procedures by which we ensure they're being used okay. or applied. Well, I think anybody else is welcome to join in obviously, but I think you're, I think your approach is is great in terms of the print the guiding principles and having you know having a, an overview the executive summary if you will and then you can go deeper if you want. I do think that's really important. Um, and um, yeah, I like the idea of doing the, the the sort of running through a couple of case studies ourselves and. Um, I'm thinking, you know, could we do that? Could we kind of devote our next meeting to that? Um, because we have a pretty good working list. We now have some information about Osage. Um, and we, we could kind of, if we could sort of solidify what we think about the criteria or the, the principles and the criteria, we could somehow get that out to the public and invite uh, input. I don't know, Andrea, you know, and all of us, we can talk about how we do that, but um, uh, yeah, because I think we need, I, I'm anxious to start making some progress to move forward now to actually do things, so. Can I suggest something that might be helpful? If Andrea, if you, if you could, just in the context of producing things like um, an account of what happened today around the addicts marker, 
um, if, if, if it was possible to re, re kind of recall that example and the process that was undertaken, the feedback, the, you know, uh, that would be an example, that would be something that would generate for us a description of a process and, and, and that would then be maybe elaborated or tweaked as we work with other cases. Um, speaking, that, I think we've, we've, we've just done it. We've just done something like it with that um, marker. I think what we did here with that marker is, is pertains more to the quote, the action group that, that says, okay, we, we know we're gonna do something with this. Now, what is it gonna, what's that gonna look like? We've already selected it, we're gonna act. This is the primary thing we wanna communicate that there was a school here. And now how are we going to do that? That's how are we gonna do that? That's part two. Part one is evaluating what thing are we gonna change and what is the primary objective of that change, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's, as you said, removal or relocation or recontextualize. So mm -hmm. I think the first part is really the big part that we've got to concern ourselves with here. Um, quite honestly, when we get down to how are we gonna, what kind of sign is it gonna be and what's the exact language? I don't think we're gonna get a lot of community interest in terms of wanting to be involved in that process. And I don't mm -hmm. know that we have to really get a lot of public input about how it works. Mm -hmm. That's just my take on it. Sure. I don't think, I think it'll depend on what it is and where it is and what the, the stakeholders for each each one of those might be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so Jeff, I think what we're recommending here is that if that language in terms of the principles and the sort of the second tier just you know sort of description of those principles is something that everybody's comfortable with that that language gets sort of socialized in a way that we that we put it on the website that we you know present that language to different boards mm -hmm. and committees i mean maybe we mark it as you know working you know it's a draft or a working sort of um, document or something like that but that it starts to get put out there is that and so that, I mean, that's sort of a next step that we would need okay. to make some decisions about today and, and move forward with. So let's get, I, I, I mean, let's get Andrea, I'd like you to kind of weigh in on how you think we ought to socialize it. Um, I think that I don't know how much input we necessarily um, need on the uh, criteria that we set up. But I think that it's important for them, for us to put out information about markers that we're planning on adding or changing or um, removing. Um, that's where I think that we would want to get the input. I think that we can share what the process is going to be, um, but I, I don't think that necessarily we need to get input specifically on that. Yep. So, what's the best way to share that information? I think. Um, we would once it's established, we would I would start putting it. Um, it would be on our website. I'd start promoting it on social media, and using our Clayton connection, and then any of the written newsletters. But it would also depend on, you know, <clears throat> for some of it has to do with just has to do with timing. So, you know, how long you guys want to keep the feedback period open. Um, it might not coincide with a written newsletter, that type of thing. So we would just really need to figure out how long you want to give the public and um, how quickly all of this needs to be wrapped up. So, so in the beginning, we developed a sort of a quasi process um, that the board approved, which involved um, uh, if you, socializing, if you will, or covering off kind of important stakeholder groups here, which really there were two that we were concerned with. And that was the history part, you know, the history section of the community foundation and also our equity commission. And so that I would, you know, just like to add, you know, adding to what Andrea said, I think, I think we would want to <clears throat> go ahead and share the guiding principles and some, version of the criteria once we've gone through it some version of the criteria with those two groups um we're sharing here's where we're headed um, let us know if you have any any suggestions just that simple and they, they their people could present it at their meetings and they could get back to us with any feedback um that's not saying we're not obligating ourselves to do everything they ask 
or anything like that. I do know, cause I do, I've heard from a couple of residents, citizens who fo who've been following this task force um, that they are very interested in the criteria. That's their whole focus is how are you ever gonna decide which things and what to do? And so I think it's important that we show that it's objective. And, and I also think we need to um, put the criteria and the, um, uh, the, the principles and the criteria before the Board of Aldermen. So I would like to, if it's okay with you all, um, I hate to wait till our next meeting, but if, if we feel like we, we might make some changes in the criteria, we could do this two ways. We could share it now or soon, you know, we can share it along with the principles now. And then once we will get that input, if there is any, and then we will have our meeting to kind of beta test this um, ourselves on the criteria. And then we can make all the ch changes at once that we would like to do. That's an option. Or we could share nothing right now. Wait till we go through our testing meeting and then share everything and get input and decide if we wanna make any changes. I, I'm, I'm okay either way, because I think the criteria are pretty darn good. But um, what do you guys think? I like the idea of sharing it now, once you've, once it's good with you, there are a couple of minor things like acronyms to spell out and that kind of thing. Uh, but I think, I also think that it would be more constructive to share it with a very short list of examples of things that we are that mm -hmm. have come to the task force and we mm -hmm. have some good ones the osage commemoration the i think the attic school is a great example for us to share um, i don't quite understand entirely the, the sort of origins of the attic school marker and maybe it's not entirely appropriate <clears throat> as this task force is concerned but i think it is and maybe one other um, but that would that will avoid people kind of getting super abstract about the, um, the, the principles. Um, and just one last thing about the attic school. I do think we, it does seem like we went through all the steps there in, in so far as there was an initial kind of problem statement that was about something missing and a determination that this should be addressed with an historical marker, research on what the historical marker should say dialogue with the committee, an open process that would invite public participation. And we've arrived at this point now. And, and we can use that journey to say more about the processes we've undertaken so far and that we intend to continue to you know, refine those so that they're consistent with our stated principles. OK, it, yes, it's just that, that that process happened without the city. It happened with the Clayton Community Foundation, the early part of that process. So that I'm sure I'm sure we could put together kind of a timeline of it or whatever if we needed. Which which brings up another piece of this. So the criteria is one thing. So principles and criteria, we would get buy-in on that and at least make it known that we've at least talked to everybody about it. And then beyond that, we are going to have to uh, put out there our process. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's what I'm wondering is, you know, right now, really what we have in sort of polished form are the guiding principles. And so, you know, is it okay to go ahead and share that, you know, again, on the website with, you know, with, you know, some specific, you know, the, the two boards and commissions you mentioned, Mayor, and then, you know, um, I mean, and I think it would be good to have someone from this group presented at, at those meetings to hear the conversation. And then, uh, you know, then from there, you know, develop and present the criteria or are you, would you like the criteria written out or draft criteria written out as part of this before you begin to, you know, we begin to share it and that process because what we have right now doesn't go that far yet. Are you asking me if I think we should share the process at the same time as we share the criteria? I'm, I'm, we don't have criteria yet. Oh, I thought we did. No, no, this is just guiding principles. Oh, but we've got some, I thought we had some criteria already. Didn't Jeff, didn't you say that we have some criteria that are pretty 
pretty good. I think they're broad, and this is the language is tricky with you know principles, criteria, and process. I think yep. a literal reading of criteria means we will use these um, determinations, you know, to make the and, and the language now is more general about the kinds of things we're interested in, like um, inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the the more, you know, I would like to hear, I mean, I think, I think the, I, I have a lot of questions about what are realistic criteria to use in a process like this in a rigid way. I don't think, <clears throat> but I don't, I, I think we, you know, there's something like, I'll give you an example at the committee, um, it says on our webpage, on the webpage now for the task force, the committee solicits input from the community. Um, and maybe we have a process for doing that that's in place or clear criteria of what um, sufficiently solicited input means. You know, I think we do probably have a sense of that, but it's not been elaborated. Yeah, and that's that I think goes into part of our process. You know, so um, I think I have a pretty clear uh, myself idea of what that means and what we're doing. I, I don't know that we've spelled it all out all the way for the community. Um, and again, if we can spell out our process, uh, that, that will go a long way because that would be in there. But definitely my what I just described is, is a lot of the process for, as you call it, socializing these things, because we would first come up with our recommendations. We would run it by the history folks, run it by the um, equity folks, run it by the board of aldermen, that run by, all of those meetings are public meetings where people could log in and comment and listen and right. see the actual stuff that we're talking about. Um, and then we, we could have uh, conduct one, like a Zoom meeting, which is just about this and invite everyone in the city to log in, you know, how we put it out in our Clayton Connections or our, our newsletter. And I think that to me, that is pretty much, that's a pretty good process, especially in, within this pandemic period. So I, we can put that up there. Maybe Andrea, you and I can talk about this we can put that up as kind of the process we're gonna use for making people aware of what we're doing. And the first thing that we're doing is putting forth some guiding principles. Um, and we're gonna take that, gonna run those guiding principles through this process. And I guess the question is, can we run the guiding principles and the criteria through the process or not? And you can make an argument either way. Um, I think, uh, there's a value in doing it all together, but I can see why it'd be a lot to chew on. Um, and then whether you do it, with it within the context of our current list or not, I can make a huge argument for doing it in the absence of a list so that there's no biases in there, um, that we just consider what's fair and square in terms of evaluating something, period. Um, so, that's kind of what I see. And I think Andrea and I, let's work on kind of what we need to put out to these groups and the public. I'm kind of coming around to the idea, you guys, I just kind of talk myself into this, that we should go ahead and have our meeting, doing our beta tests on the criteria, get the criteria done, and then we can have an executive summary and a fuller version of those to uh, put out there as well. We'll put principles and criteria before these groups all at once after the next meeting, and then we can move on to process, or maybe we'll even have, maybe Andrea and I will be fine tune the process a little bit, and maybe we'll be able to put that with it. Um, how does that sound, guys? Yeah, I was actually gonna add that I think if you did it together, it would speed up the process, because if you if, you know push things through piece by piece, if you will, um, you're gonna run into the meeting schedules. You know, The Community Equity Commission meets once a month, their meeting is tomorrow. Um, and so we wouldn't be able to put anything on the agenda until February. And then, you know, it just kind of uh, keeps going from there. So I think it would be quicker to try to do it together. 
Right. Me too. Okay. Anybody have any thoughts about what we all just said? Are we good with that? Nodding. Okay, good. Yes. yes. <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I mean, read, read through it because I mean, I think it is, it, I mean, it reflects a lot of the language that we've already discussed in terms of criteria. I think as Jeff was was saying, it, it, it doesn't create that sort of objective sort of yes, no checklist kind of criteria that you usually think about as criteria. And in some ways, you know, I, I, I feel like I feel like the language that is here gives gives anybody who reads it a pretty clear idea of what that criteria is going to look like. Um, but um, but we can work on it some more and 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 do that sort of community unveiling or you know part of that later. Well, why don't you guys give some thought if there are, if there are changes to this criteria that you're already thinking of that you'd rather we use something different or whatever at on the on the 24th of February our next meeting um, have that to us you know by the time of the meeting and then let's construct uh, let's pick a couple of things to run through these criteria ourselves in that meeting and have that be our sort of uh, way of evaluating our own criteria. Does that sound like a plan for the next meeting? Okay, and does anybody want, do we wanna pick now which objects we wanna go through at the time or do we wanna do it then or in between? Maybe we could recommend a couple um, and get, cause I think we'll want to have, you know, there's background information and research and, you know, yeah. on okay. those sort of handy um, when we're doing that. So we'll, we'll need to prepare a little bit if we're gonna do that at the next meeting. Okay. But I don't know that we need to do that right now. Okay, good. Um, um, we need to quit. <laughs> I know, right? That's one thing. Um, I, you know, I don't have the meetings on my calendar. I don't know if they've been- um, Andrea, Andrea- They're set up, but okay. Yeah, I just so that. when you start to- um, like, I'm, I'm already booked for that. There's an attendee. It's Dan Sokol. Dan, I know you can hear me. We can't hear you at this point, but oh, do you have anything that you wanted to say to us? Because uh, so that we can then we're then we're going to adjourn. Dan is one of our aldermen. He's in Ward Three. No, I'm just an interested attendee. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, Okay, so we know our next meeting is February 24th at noon. We'll plan to go, run through this sort of little exercise there with input from our two experts. And, um, and Andrea and I, in the meantime, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about process and communication of all this. Uh, so we're ready with that. Um, I think that's it for us. What do you guys, any, any other input questions? I can't even tell you how grateful we are as a city that you guys are all participating. And Gwen and Jeff and Katie, thank you so much. And Meredith, um, you guys are top drawer and uh, we're just lucky to have you on board here. So thanks. Thank all right, you. everybody go okay. enjoy the rest of their day. Okay, I'll do. Good seeing you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.